Hey, so uh, I thought I'd just like to show you real quick what's new in Ferrum.js. Um, it's uh, a library geared towards functional programming and um, in JavaScript, and it's really starting to include a lot of things you'd, you'd usually expect from a standard library, but of course, JavaScript's standard library is very lean, so it doesn't have a lot of that stuff. If you go to www.ferrumjs.org, you can check out the documentation and the API documentation that's over here. And you can just go through and check what you see. So there's like standard stuff for functional programming, like uh, like a pipe function uh, for composition. Um, there's currying in there. You have operators as, um, operators as, um, as functions and a lot of stuff for working with sequences and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, some things I have quite like is like the cloning function or the equality checking. So in Python, you, you'd, uh, you'd often use deep clone or shallow clone for stuff, uh, and that would be in the standard library in JavaScript that isn't there. So now you can basically use uh, Ferrum.js to substitute that. And the newest version has um, two pretty cool features I'd like to talk about, which is an infrastructure for hashing. Uh, that's over here. You can see there, there's just a lot of functions that you can can basically input any object and generate a, um, a, a hash value that is a string, so it's nice for comparison. And then of course you have the hash set and the hash map um, types where I can actually store these objects. And there, there's actually a second feature which I'd like to show you off first, which is testing of examples in documentation. So um, that is just, no, I don't want to update later maybe. That is just a little new feature and a little new companion library. There's like, if you, if you go through the documentation, you can see there's a lot of examples. And half a year ago, there were a lot of bugs in these examples because it was hard to test them because you'd have to copy all of that, copy that into a file and then execute it and then see if that works and if there is a bug, fix it and then copy it back. And of course, that was a really, really a process that is prone to errors. If, you, if you're if an Avid REST user, you're used to just writing your examples in your API documentation and then running these examples as part of your um, of, of your tests. And so I thought it would be nice to be able to actually do the same with um, in, in JavaScript. And so uh, I've simply written a library to do that because actually I couldn't find anything else that does that. So um, now there's this companion library to Ferrum called Ferrum doc test, Ferrum doc test, and there's some documentation how you can use it. And basically you just drop that in and any examples you have in, um, in markdown files or in JavaScript files in your documentation, you can basically test these. And yeah, check out all of this. There's like even source map support included so you can actually get useful line numbers when, you're, when your tests fail. So I'm just going to quickly switch over to my terminal. So you can see I've, I've, I've tried some stuff there. Um, basically, let's clear that. Basically, I've created a little Node.js project with some dummy functions. You can see in this JS, there's like some dummy stuff in there um, that, that we're going to execute and that has, that has some examples. Um, and uh, if we, if we uh, wanna actually outfit that with, um, with documentation tests and we're going to install the ferrum doc test and we're going to install Mocha and just run that and it's going to install the two packages. Mocha is like the testing framework you'd use for your normal tests. And then ferrum.doc test is actually set up so it can um, take, it can extract the tests from your documentation, from your markdown files and supply them to whatever testing framework you're using. And by default, there's a template for Mocha included, but you can basically use anything else. And um, that is taking some time, so we're done. Um, and now basically what uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the documentation here 
and copy that command line. You can see there's an index.js file and there's a readme.js and we want a readme.md. We want to test both of those. So we're going to use the firm doctest exec uh, command with index.js and we're going to want to use mdsrc read me our readme is small uh, lowercase so we're going to do that and of course we don't have any other tests so i'm just going to quickly remove from the example this this uh, subdirectory test i'm just going to run that and hopefully that's going to work right and it is running our test so we can see index.js stuff Oh, I, I accidentally pasted that. NXJS stuff. Um, and that's just, it just enum enumerates the examples and uh, index uh, and, and here is in the readme. So we can see the file name and then we can check what it is. And then actually it's like any other test, it's going to give you a, um, a, a stack trace where it went wrong. And then we can just open index.js in my vim, which is very old school, but I like it a lot. Um, I'm just going to quickly activate numeration, enumeration, and we can just see here there's this bogus assert. And instead, we're just going to call to fix this problem, call our da, no, our stuff function. I'm just going to use that. I'm going to run the tests and you can see now the tests are of course working of course in normal tests you wouldn't really use console.log because it creates you it creates these ugly um these these ugly printouts but you can see now the tests are working perfectly and then if you actually check here so it even makes sure that you can use um it even makes sure that you can use um, the name of the package, which normally wouldn't really be possible because uh, normally you'd have to use a relative import in Mocha because there's no such package available, but uh, doc test handles all of that stuff, creates temporary files, so you can very easily execute your tests. And of course, if you check here, that's just really a simple command line invocation. So you supply the, you supply the files you want to, you want to, um, extract the examples from and then the shell command that you want to supply them to and uh, the location of the file is stored in the doc test file environment variable and um, right so you can just really supply it to anything and um, yeah you can supply it to anything and if we use minus h like anything it just it will just show us the um, the help so here you can specify what, uh, wha how it should um, include the um, package JSON because of course you wanna include the name of the package. So you can actually import it directly instead of with uh, a relative import and then you can specify a template. And then if you want to use that inside your package JSON, see, so I've already added that. So. I, I could just paste it here into my scripts, but that's already there and that looks all right. So I, I can just use npm run test. So, and that works and that just includes the test like, uh, like you normally would. And uh, a nice effect from this is actually that if you would include, so, so since we can just add our normal tests here, we can now create a test file. Let me just quickly do that. Um, test. Just going to create a directory. Very dummy names here. And then in here you can actually go um, stuff. I think it was Right, and we can just include it here. Oh, let me just do that manually then. Right, and so that works, whereas if you were to run Mocha manually, 
it's going to tell you it can't find the module Ferrum demo. So that's a feature I really like. Just it's 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 like a very small thing, but um, I think it's so much cleaner to be able to actually include the uh, package as it is. And that was actually a lot of work. It actually has to go in and create a temporary directory and a temporary node modules folder, and it does all of that in the background. And then if we check our README, you can see there's the same thing going on, and then we actually have a test that wouldn't work for, we can just make that not work actually, right? And that is not included because it has the no test tag. So um, there you go. That's basically how you can test your examples with JavaScript, uh, your, your examples inside JavaScript code now. You can also like actually use uh, ESLint on this or another linter to um, check if your uh, examples are in the proper coding style. Now, actually, I haven't got ESLint installed and that would take a lot of time to install it now. So you can easily just integrate that in anything else and that's actually quite nice and I think I'm going to do that for my projects. There's Right now, there's an issue that ESLint doesn't really support source maps, so it won't give you nice locations of the errors, which is kind of the caveat right now. And I'm trying to find ways to work around that, which actually isn't that easy. There are like, there, there are a couple of issues with uh, in, in ESLint that try to add source map support, but it didn't really catch on at any point because of course they're saying, well, why would you want to use source maps in ESLint? ESLint is for your original source, but of course that, that doesn't really apply to a case like this, which is really just extracting the, uh, just 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 pasting some code into some other file because it's in the documentation. So and um, so then let's check out the second big feature I wanted to talk about, which are hash maps, uh, and um, and hashing. So uh, this new version of Ferrum um, basically adds the hashable trait and the hasher trait. So you can. If we could click in here, as yes, we can click here, um, Ferrum in in introduces this concept of traits, which are very similar to what you'd call traits in Rust. Um, yeah, well, they're similar to what you'd call traits in Rust. They're basically um, add support for runtime polymorphism, so you can you can actually have say okay. This is how like this is how an array needs to be hashed. This is how an object needs to be hashed. This is how a string needs to be hashed, and so on. So you can decide it for each type. And the advantage there is really that that if if there's a new third party type that you need to add support for, you can just easily do that. And if there's a library, they can actually implement these traits for themselves, which is a lot more flexible than the kind of the old approach, uh, where you'd where, where the library you're writing would have to include all of the implementations for all possible types up front. And so there's there's the object hash library, which of course already in the past has has uh, has had a great infrastructure for object hashing, but it suffered from that problem. So if you'd have a third party class, you could use the built in support for arbitrary types. But uh, then if that didn't really do what you needed for your particular class, because maybe it has some special behavior, you couldn't specify that, or it would be very difficult. And that is basically what Ferrum remedies. And um, now using this infrastructure, um, it's very easy to add new traits like, for instance, hashing. And internally, hashing really just works. It, it, it recursively, like we can actually go into the source and look at that. So, um, of course, there's a lot of stuff. Like some of the types have um, have a standard hashes, which are not really exposed, but they're there. So you can have type tagging in your hashes. And then right here, we have the default hasher, which looks very complicated, but it's actually mostly concerned with state management. Actually, pretty much what it does, it just, um, it just converts every element to, to a um, byte array, to a u and 8 array, and then supplies that to the underlying hasher, which is just xx hash 64 right now, which is like some hash function. So you have this nice split. You have on one side, you have the method of actually hashing stuff. Um, 
uh, which which really just works on binary and you can use any custom hash function. You can also use zip hash or mama hash. There's there's a lot to choose from. And then on the other hand, you have like the 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 visitor, which is this thing that that um, is called for each object that needs to be hashed and then kind of just recursively um, is, is being called recursively. So um, this this will just end up um, recursing. It's it's, it's co-recursion, so it's a bit complex. But if you look up here, um, 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 um you're right. These really just go back into the hasher and say, okay, an array consists of of all the elements of the array. So um, and and that is specific for the type. So you have these three elements. You have the type specific hashing method. You have the visitor. And you have the hash function, and these are nicely split, which is a lot nicer than it's actually done in Rust or in Python, in my opinion. Um, and that allows you to customize a lot of stuff. So you could actually, you have a very nice default behavior for many types, but then if you need to customize something, you can still write your custom visitor and use that. And um, so that, that is very, that is, that looks very complex, but actually it's just a couple hundred lines of code. And and mostly boilerplate, because when you when you get how this works, it's really fairly straightforward. And then what you can what you can check out there's there's this um, hash map, which is just basically a type that that works like an ES6 map, but um, it will actually do content based comparison. So there's this basic example here. Um, where you you require it, and then uh, if you'd use a new six map, so you'd supply an empty object as a key, and then you would tr try to retrieve the value of that. It doesn't really work because those are not the same object. Those are those two objects have the same value, so they have the same content, but they don't have the same identity so that internally that is basically the same memory address. And so it's comparing memory address and there's special behavior for sometimes like strings where it actually does object-based comparison and that's just because, well, JavaScript is old and a bit odd, but uh, for most types it doesn't really do object-based comparison and that's 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 always been a bit of an awkward behavior in, in JavaScript. And so if you use a, a hash map, just here, like it basically works the same way. You, I mean, you, you can also use new hash map, and there's a lot of interfaces, so you don't have to use this very functional style I tend to like to use. But basically, you also supply a list of key value pairs, and then you can just use whatever value you, you want. And it's it's kind of hard. So 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 it's it's. A lot of the functionality of Ferrum is kind of hard to explain why you'd want to use it, because in practice you, you really need it all the time. It's like it, it it doesn't have like this feature you'd need to use in a specific situation. It's just infrastructure to let you write algorithms more quickly, to let you write logic more quickly, because you don't you don't really have to think about this other thing. So. Um, I've I've used it lots of times, so just any any container really. Um, of often you need that you don't even really know that that you'll need uh, object based comparison, and so that's very nice to have. Um, and of course, this behavior down here is um, much more like what you'd probably want to use. Um, it's it it fits much better with the mental model. Actually, we have of how how comparison works. So um, that is just very nice that just uh, it, it kind of just gets out of your way to let you do whatever you want to code instead of requiring you to really think about, okay, is, is this type like um, equality comparable like a string or a number or is it anything else that I need to do something special for? You can just basically use a hash map and it will get out of your way and it will let you do that if you create uh, and and it will let you just be used if you create your own class like a user class and you want to compare you you want to add your users to a hash map no problem you can go for it and you can just plug that in implement a a um uh, a, 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 a implement the hashable interface 
which is down here, which can just go in. Uh, and here's an example of how you'd actually do that. So you can like have any types, for instance, an unordered pair. Um, and um, you can just very straightforward, just implement that and then it will just work. So again, it's hard to explain why this is useful. It's just so very generic, but so let's, let's just try out a basic use case. Install Ferrum. So I'm just going to first just install Ferrum in this project and then we're going to go into the REPL and I'm, I'm just going to demonstrate some use cases for that. So, um, yeah, right. Node. I forgot what commands are. I forgot the node command, which is odd. I'm just going to hash app. I'm just going to pull in my hash map constructor. Oh, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Oh, it's a hash map. It has to be a hash map, right? And it wants me to supply an empty array. So this is basically how you use it. You can also use other ways. You can, you can also use the normal hash map constructor, new hash map, which works. Or what I'd like to use is actually something more functional, like what you'd use in, in, in Rust, hashmap.new. So it provides these sorts of functions for more convenient construction, and you can actually carry those functions. So there's a lot of advanced things you can do with those. Again, one, one of those very small things, but it just gets out of your way, really. So um, let's construct, um, actually let's, um, Let's just um, create a hash map. So, and we can just do set and supply an empty object, 42. And uh, so it will just print you that and it, uh, and it will tell you an empty array, an empty object maps to 42. And then we can just use get an empty object and it will just return 42. It works for really anything. Let's do um, uh, you can use anything as a key like this, um, uh, this null value, right? Uh, you can use this null value and it will just supply a proper result. And we can we can do something more complex, like we can do a deeply nested array, and that will also just work. And we can like like do a tuple. My number is thirteen, and we're going to go for thirteen. I did something wrong, right? Of course. And I need to use the set function. So it will just print it out like you would expect, like my number is 13. Um, and then when you want to extract that value again, nope, let's not do that. It will just give you out that value and you can have a more comp, you can change that number. So, and you have 14 and it will give you the correct value. And you basically can extend it to anything. So the example here with that, that is like showing off using a tuple, but you could also um, have objects as keys. As I did before, you can have, um, you can you can nest your hash map. So you can have, uh, have a multi-dimensional hash map. You can have, um, E6 maps, really, 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 there's no limiting what you can do there. Um, 
just just implement that hasher interface and if you if you really need so so Ferrum by default doesn't really let you do fuzzy stuff so if there's a type it doesn't know about it will just complain and tell you please implement the interface for that which is a deliberate choice because that just tends to make your code a lot more reliable if it doesn't know how to hash a type it will just tell you tell me how to do that but there actually is a way to get around that so because Ferrum is so flexible and what it can do, you can you can basically implement a um, hasher that just defers to object hash, and so that th this is actually very powerful. So it will it will basically recursively use object hash here whenever there is no um, when when whenever there's no way to to hash an object. So it will just use that as a fallback. And then actually, if, if that's like uh, a complex object, like a, a structure, and that actually results in hashing a type that f that uh, Ferrum supports again, it will go back and that is what this replace has for. And so that, that's just to show off that, um, that you can really do a lot of advanced stuff with that. And then you can, of course, actually yeah, you can you can basically you you can supply that new hasher to your hash map. So uh, let me see if I can see where this is. Right. So you can pretty much customize what sort of hasher your hash set or hash map is supposed to use, and then you can do this complex stuff. Up here is another example of how you can actually create a hasher that treats undefined and null as the same value. So um. This will just do the same thing as usual, but it will um it will replace undefined with null here. And you can use that. And I'm probably going to pull this thing, this object hash based hasher into its own library. And I'm going to create a library called um Ferrum Heuristics. So um then, then there is a place where you can actually have all these all these visitors that actually do fuzzy, that actually support fuzzy matching. So you can actually have your equality checking um, strict and well defined if you want it. But if you just want heuristics and just get, want to get want to have want to get some work done, you can use the heuristic version, and and that will probably mostly just work. And then I personally think it's going to probably lead to some some odd errors and and not as reliable code but of course for for a lot of projects that is okay. Right. 